The Digital Photography Cafe show is brought to you by Focus Pyramid, the autofocus lens calibration tool for your camera, and by Shootproof, the easy way to proof and sell your photos online. Welcome to the Digital Photography Cafe Show. Join hosts Trevor Curran and Joseph Christina as they chat about the art and business of photography. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. This is episode 129. I'm Joseph Christina here with my co-host Trevor Curran. On last week's episode, we talked about Twitter's visual tweets, Adobe's user account hack, found to be more extensive than first reported, and we looked at Google's online photo enhancement tools. If you haven't watched last week's show, I encourage you to do so. You can find it at our website, digitalphotographycafe.com, in iTunes, listen with the popular Stitcher, TuneIn, and Xbox music apps, or watch in HD on TiVo. Hey, Joe, we're back. How you doing, my friend? We are here. Good, good. Another week. Yes, another week. And we are live, or Memorex, something like that. Well, we're live right now, I guess. Yes. So, all right. So let's kind of get in. We're going to have a little bit of a soapbox session, I guess. All uh, right. We we need to- You get on yours, and I will get on Yes, yes. We want to, you know, we try to, you know, give you guys information that we think is helpful to you, that that will help grow your business, that will just help you out in your- your, with your photography or what have you. And sometimes this includes technology, sometimes it includes technique. Well, if you remember back on uh, our Photo Plus Expo recap, um, I believe it was episode 127, um, I had mentioned to you how I had purchased a Drobo transporter. Um, yes. It's like this FTP kind of at your own location it sinks you know it does backup it does syncing it does all this really cool stuff yes it's like your little hot spot yes yes so um the promotion they had for photo plus expo was with adorama camera in new york city right the price was great it was 229 you got the hard drive a one terabyte hard drive you got the unit itself Mm -hmm. um which is significantly cheaper normally it's 299 so it it was a pretty nice savings yeah, sure. So I told you I had gone online, I ordered it, and I was waiting for it to come. Okay, right. so I go online to Adorama, I order it, and, you know, it gives you the different shipping options. It gives a free, you know, free shipping, two-day, five-day, you know, all these different options. So, right. you know, I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to go for the free shipping. It's not urgent that I get it, like, immediately, but I'm only in northern New Jersey. I'm only literally, like, an hour and a half away from where they ship. Um, I know from experience ordering from other New York City companies that when they ship things out UPS, I usually get them next day or two days. Sure. So, but it did in fact say on the checkout that, you know, shipping seven to 10 business days. Okay. Well, you're just over the river. I'm just, I'm just over the river. Yeah. So you, you wouldn't think that it would really take that long. Well, no. So first off they shipped the Drobo transporter and the hard drive as two separate packages. Um, I, right. for whatever reason, whatever, I don't, I don't know. Maybe the hard drive was temporarily out of stock. They were waiting to get it in, whatever. So sure. they used a hybrid shipping method where they send it to UPS. UPS takes it to a post office. And from there it's delivered through the postal system. And that's how I guess Adorama can afford to offer free shipping is they're doing it, you know, with a little bit of voodoo, a song and a dance and, you know, some magic dust <laughs> right. sprinkled on top. Exactly. So, you know, I got the Drobo unit itself within a few days, but the unit itself does no good without the hard drive. So sure. I'm waiting for the hard drive. I'm tracking the shipping and, and everything. And then I'm, I'm looking close at the shipping. Now, keep in mind, I just said, I'm about an hour and a half away from the shipping center here in New Jersey. They ship the hard drive first to Maryland, then to North Carolina, then back to New Jersey, almost right where it started from. And then it had to come to me. It basically traveled like, you know, 2000. It did like this East Coast loop. And I'm like, really? Seriously, that's the way you can afford to do free shipping. So needless to say, it, you know, it is what it is. It's in, it's in transit. So I didn't get it on the estimated day that they said that, that I would receive it. 
So I called them up the following, you know, business day and I had to connect to their customer service. Well, first off, their customer service is not here in the US. It's obviously overseas using a very poor VoIP communication system and connecting with people who, you know, whose English is not their first language. Excellent. Um, it was a very miserable conversation to try and communicate with them to find out where the heck my package is. And ultimately at the end of the day was, well, it hasn't been 10 business days yet. So, and no, it, it wasn't, you know, but their whole shipping process left little to be desired. And right. It, along with, um, you know, speaking to someone that barely speaks the language, um, along with, yeah, uh, you know, yeah, yeah along with the, the lousy um, internet connection, voice quality that we had and stuff. So needless to say, long story, even longer, I finally received the hard drive like a day or two ago, um, have not had a chance to put it together and even test it out again. But one thing I do know is that I will in the future be ordering my equipment from B&H or Amazon. <laughs> right. And that's all yeah. I'm going to say out, on that. Going elsewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what happens. And you know what's funny is a lot of the big major corporations that kind of outsourced a lot of their quote unquote data centers or call or, centers, or not, not data centers, call yeah. centers, yeah. right? And that outsourcing has kind of leave, you know, it's kind of left people with uh, a bad taste in their mouth about the companies. Yeah. And many times, you know, I'll call in um, to, let's say, Dish Network, for example. For many years, I would call in and I'd be in Dubai. Right. It's like, I do not want to speak to you in Dubai. Okay. I would like to speak to someone in the U.S. And if you request to speak to someone in the U.S., they say, please hold. And they will connect you with someone in the U.S., right. kind of like a fallback. Right. But, you know, honestly... Um, many of the companies, you know, are seeing that this is, you know, a detriment. Yes. It's not, you know, this, the amount that they're saving in money is really, you know, it's, it's, it's putting out a business. lot of Ill, Ill will. Yeah. yeah. It's hurting their business. It's, it's making that full circle, um, you know, from soup to nuts, from start to finish a, a miserable one. Right. You know, they might be doing great at the, at showing you the product. They might be doing great at taking your money. Yep. They might be doing halfway decent at sending it, but if there's any kind of, you know, speaking that you need to do, talk to someone about how tech support or anything, and they're falling, you know, and they're failing, what ends up happening is you just, you know, you don't go back. Right. So, right. yeah, I, you know, and by you moving to a different company than Adorama, whoever you use, it doesn't really make a difference. It's just, you know, it's your prerogative, and I can see it yeah. 100%. Yeah. And this is the type of stuff that happens all the time. You know, and hopefully someone takes note of it and they understand that, you know, you need to have this full customer service from beginning to end. And it just it just needs to be done right. right. And the same thing goes with our photo, you know, our photographic businesses. We need to be able to, you know, get people in the door, service them properly, make sure yes. you do a really good job. But after the fact, when you're, you know, that final communication that is so critical because that's that lasting taste that they have that's in their right. mouth is how did it, you know, how was the book? How quickly did they get the book? You know, how quickly did you respond to that email uh, or whatever the case might be yep. that finishing up that last, and that's the hardest for all of us to do because, sure. you know, you already got them in the door. You already got your money. You already did the job. And now it's like, oh, and many of us fall you know, by the wayside when it comes to that final push, that end of customer support. And that's something that I think, you know, we have to kind of put it out to everyone to kind of analyze what you do and make sure you're finalizing it properly. Right? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, we've talked about that on the show a lot about the the customer experience, you know, evaluating your business from your customer standpoint and seeing how you handle the flow of communication, how you handle the flow of work. Um, it, it is very, very important. I mean, we're not selling widgets here. We're not an electronic superstore selling widgets. We're selling services. Right. So that personalized customer service is extremely important you oh, know, yeah. in the type of business Absolutely. we do. I mean, you know, yeah. being a U.S. citizen, living in this country my entire life, I want to see the United States succeed, of course. And right. I would love for all jobs to be kept in this country. The fact of the matter is it's not possible, you know, just with the economy, with the with the amount of money and the competition worldwide. I, I understand outsourcing, but if you're going to outsource, I, I think that you really need to look at that and outsource to um, a company who can provide the service at a level that 
your customers expect. You know, I and then, you know I can say I, first I agree. Yeah, firsthand Google has Google outsources their their data centers. I mean, I've called Google business apps before um for you know on behalf of my clients and stuff and and um it it sounds like I'm calling overseas. But sure. the language clarity is great. The service right, right. was phenomenal. They're vetting all these yeah, they're vetting all these people. Yeah. Not just like a random random guy. Yeah, that's no, right. They're ab- using a absolutely. higher level, a higher tier call center for their work because they know the importance of it. So yeah, I don't know. That's yeah. all I can say. That's all I'm gonna say about yeah. it. But you know what? You know, speaking about widgets, um, you know, my f- iPhone, I was talking to you guys about the iPhone and how we returned it because it had a proximity sensor problem and we got a new one. We got this new one in and now all of a sudden, you know, we're having extremely slow data speeds and I didn't know why. Right. You know, make us long story short, I spent probably about two or three days with this whole iPhone, you know, thing. And here it goes right back to customer service. Um, you know, and tech support says, hey, you know, uh, we don't know what's wrong with your phone. So let's go ahead and run some tests. They run some tests on the phone, comes back, and we can't even get the test results back because the data is going so slow. Okay, that's fine. Um, they say, so there's something wrong with the phone. Go and grab a new one. We go into Apple. Luckily, Apple, you know, it's under warranty, swaps it out. I got another brand new iPhone 5. <laughs> And, what is this uh, number three? You know, <laughs> this is number three. And um, you know, I'm I immediately I try to try it again. Data is complete, you know, crap. And I'm like, so what's going on? They're like, well, we can't figure it out. You know, we don't see any kind of throttling. The account looks clean. Everything is great. You know, it must be the SIM card. So I have to drive all the way to my AT and T. It's got to be the actual AT and T store, not like an authorized dealer, so I can pick up a SIM card. Right. So I do that. So I'm sitting at AT AT&T yesterday and I tested out. And sure enough, what happens? Slow, dead speed again. The woman behind the desk is like, here's our phone. We're going to call in, you know, right from here. You can go talk to someone. 56 minutes later, after speaking to from, you know, from the, the one person to tech support, to the floor manager, to this and that. And, you know, I got the numbers and IDs and all these people come to find out my account was throttled due to usage because I have an unlimited plan. Yes. And once you hit three or five gigabytes on that plan, um, your account is throttled. It's slowed down. Yep. So, you know, I'm fighting with these people back and forth and I'm, I'm explaining to them like, well, for one thing, you guys said I wasn't throttled, but now I am. Okay, so now you just wasted a whole day and getting a phone for nothing, SIM card for nothing, traveling around yeah, completely yep. for nothing. All that inconvenience, because they don't know, right. Because they don't know what they're doing. And then now all of a sudden you say that I'm throttled. Well, what is throttling anyways? Well, there's no, you know, uh, the one person says, well, you know, normally what it would be is, you know, you'd go down to like maybe a 3G speed. It would be slower, but, you know, well, I'm like, well, so what speed am I at when it's saying 00.00 on my speed test? And why can you not send uh, me a test to find out results on the phone to see if there's something wrong? Because it's completely dead. So here I am being throttled now down to zero speed yep. because somehow I've exceeded that whatever limit is, but it doesn't supposed to be a limit. So what's yeah, because it's unlimited. Is, <laughs> it's unlimited. So since it's unlimited, I don't even get a message like my daughter or my wife would be like, hey, you're approaching your limit for the month. You know, be careful. You're going to go over and get overage charges. They never say anything because I'm unlimited, but yet they still limit. Yeah. Um, so it's like, you know, so at this point now, it's like time to go to corporate with this and do all this nonsense. But, you know, come to find out, it's like less than 0.1 or 0.3% of the entire populace of AT&T's user base that actually have these grandfathered in unlimited counts like you and myself yep, have. Yep. So it's not a lot, a lot, you know, a big, vast majority. It's a small minority. And for them to even, you know, bother with this is just unbelievable. Absolutely, yeah. you know that's right. You would think that with such a small population being grandfathered in, you know, if in fact those numbers are true, that they would just let us have our data. You know, let us have right. our cake and eat it too. There's there's not that many of them. On the other hand, right. there's not that many of us, and probably if they piss us off enough, we'll just go away. You know, we'll go yeah. to another and service what or what have you. And and right. honestly, they probably don't even care because at that point. Their network is using less data overall. They'll get more people in to replace us at $30 a month with a cap to their data usage. And if they go over, then they go over. Yeah. 
you know, then they pay, then yeah. those people will pay more. So yeah, again, it's, it's kind of this, you know, it's their world and we have to live in it. And unfortunately yeah. I don't think we're going to have enough of a voice, you know? No, probably, probably not. Probably not. It's the whole idea of, you know, of unlimited to actually being limited, um, but doing it kind of, you know, behind the back so that you don't even know that it's happening. And then, you know, when you request information about it, um, they, most of the people that are behind their, you know, behind the desk, they, they don't have a they don't clue. Know. They don't even, they don't even understand that They're just employees. That works. I mean, they're not policy They have makers. not a clue. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Anyways, guys, going forward. FAA halts man's drone photography business. Do you love this? I love it because you know what? We just spoke about these little drones, these little unmanned, um, you know, remote control piloted cameras. These helicopter things. Yeah, they're almost like they're kind of helicopters. Some of them have like four props, six props, a whole bunch of props. Some of them are internal props. Some are external. Um, Some of them weigh almost next to nothing and they have little cameras on them, maybe even GoPros or something like that. Right. Um, Very cool. Very, very cool. But now, you know, the FAA <laughs> throws basically these people like under the bus and says, hey, you know what? Sorry, you can't run a business that flies any type of device and take pictures at the same time. Yeah, yeah, for commercial use. Yeah, so yeah. that's, this is the thing. So yeah, on episode 127, we talked about that. And actually one of our listeners, um, Ed Krisiak, pointed that out to us on our Facebook page. I had no idea about this. I'm thinking, yeah. I'm ooing and eyeing over this cool technology. How fun would it be to fly this little remote controlled helicopter with a camera on it and stuff? And, sure. you know, just think what you could do with it and, and everything. And and as it turns out, it violates FAA flight regulations. Um, the, you know, hobby photographers or hobby um, RC pilots or whatever can right. fly helicopters without a problem. They can fly one of these camera rig helicopters without a problem with a camera on it because they're not doing it for money. As soon as you commercialize it, as soon as you do it as a business and start charging money for that service, it violates the FAA flight regulations. So so now all of these people who have started businesses or have added these services to their listing um, really shouldn't be doing it. You know, they're they're, they're in violation of these these FAA rules and regulations, which is crazy. I mean, I get it, but it's crazy that like, you know, they didn't make a bigger thing of this before you bought the equipment or, or what have you, you know? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. I mean, all right, guys, you know, don't go and fly one of these things, you know, a half a mile from your local airport because, you know, you should be taken down and fined and maybe even jail time for doing so because, if this isn't regulated, I mean, it's very easy to strap a bomb to it, some C4, with your little remote detonator, fly it into a landing plane and blow the thing sure. up. Um, there I mean, has to be regulations. People sure. are nuts. There has to be regulations for that. But if you're in, you know, you're on the, you're doing some photography of a house, you know, and you're flying around the house for some really great shots for uh, real estate, maybe doing a million dollar home and you want to get some nice aerial stuff and you don't want to hire in the helicopter for $2,000. Uh, right, minute. right. Um, you know, I think it's a it's a great way. You know, it's the idea of asking for um, asking for forgiveness rather than instead asking of for asking, permission. Yeah. Asking for permission. You know, it's to me, you know, I don't want to be, you know, say, oh, you know, go and do it and 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 whatever. Yeah. You know, it's just one of those things that, you know, these people are now going to be fighting the good fight for all of us. But they're wasting their time, money, resources, headache, their life. Yeah, for doing. Yeah, so. I mean, there's the FAA, there's definitely going to be a group of people out there petitioning the FAA to try and sure. you know clear this up, put some type of um, stipulations in place so commercial sure. photographers can utilize this equipment for their businesses. Um, but right now, it's not there. And yeah, it just doesn't exist. Put in some rules and regulations. This is what you you know. This right. is the guidelines that you must follow. Um, to do so, or, you know, this is that $150, uh, licensing fee that you have to pay per year so that we know that you're out there. Uh, maybe you have to register, um, your, you know, the transponders, sure, you know, numbers the, or whatever, yeah. you know, whatever it is, the frequency, uh, numbers or whatever, something, yep. but instead they're just going to push it underneath the rug. These people are going to be flailing the arms, you know, in their hands. Well, until the group be- becomes big enough, until enough photographers, hobbyists, manufacturers of this equipment i mean think of this once this 
gets out into the public, into the masses, people aren't, photographers aren't going to go out and buy these things for their businesses. Not if, not if knowing that they're, they're in violation. I mean, that's going to hurt right. their business. So you get enough people together, you get enough people making a stink about it, then maybe the FAA will listen. Maybe they'll start trying to put some procedures and new regulations, some tests, some certification, something like that in place. Right. But well, I, I tell you what, the we're gonna we're gonna have to put up online or up through this video uh, stream some um, um, video that was captured that we took a look at um, from one of these little drone things. Yeah, it's from a company and called Flyboys. Yeah, from Flyboys. It is just amazing. Beautiful. I mean, with the right music, um, it, it just it when you look at this, it almost it makes you feel like you're floating like an angel. Yes. You know, like yes. a bird. It's just so beautiful, and the movement is so liquid, yes. so soft, non abrupt. That it's just you. I don't think there's any way to capture these type of images. Um, without this type of device. No, or it's without a full-size beautiful. helicopter or plane or what have you to do these right. flybys. You know, but yeah. even at that, yeah. I mean, you can't do a hover in an airplane, so you have to use a helicopter, you know, a full-size Absolutely. helicopter. Well, I mean, who can afford that? I mean, nobody for real estate photography is going to pay that money, you know, not unless it's for, like, you know, a, a commercial building, like a skyscraper yeah. or something in New York City. I mean, then they might, but, sure. you know. Yeah, or one of the million dollar homes that we have here, you know, on the coast of Florida and Palm Beach or whatever, yeah. they're selling it for 30 million. They don't mind spending, you know, uh, five grand on someone in a Cessna to come back, you yeah, know, come do a fly by, by and yeah. take some aerial shots. And um, uh, matter of fact, someone I know uh, or that I knew used to do that. They used to make a lot of money at doing sure. that. Sure. Um, but yeah, so yeah, the, I mean, the look on this stuff is just amazing. Beautiful. And I definitely think by what we saw at the trade show, um, that these things are going to be on an upward swing yep. and there's going to be a lot more people buying them because they're so reasonably, co you know, the cost is, I mean, a couple hundred bucks, two, 300 bucks, and you have something that will create, you know, stellar, you know, video or stellar shots that you can go and put into your portfolio or to add to some type of real estate, you know, package or whatnot. Right. So, yeah, it's going to be an interesting uh, uh, battle, I think, coming very soon because they, they, God, that had to be like what two or three, or maybe even more vendors that were selling these things. So yeah, that's right. We'll see what happens. That's right. Yeah, you know, talking about. I mean, on the upside with the FAA, though, they did right. just announce that they are um, revising their regulations on using the use of uh, portable electronic devices in flights. Yeah. So imagine your iPad will no longer crash. Yeah. Um, that's 747. So that's really good. Yeah. They finally figured that out. Congratulations, FAA. You are on yes, it. Yes, yes. I mean, on we it. all knew for years that that these devices don't actually interfere with the the radios and stuff in the cockpits and things. But really, I think what it is, it, it was just old regulations from back when, you know, commercial flight first began right. where electronic devices of any kind in the passenger compartment could probably cause problems, radio interference and such. Yeah. And they've just never changed them. You know, they. Yeah. Well, yeah. Instead of researching, let's just say no. I mean, I'm sure why, they researched why, it, why but they just, that? you know, oh, they're like, on. you know what? It ain't broke. <laughs> let's not try and fix it. Well, let's uh, keep people paying attention during our safety announcements and stuff. But now you don't have to pay attention. Because apparently you can use, from the time you sit your butt on the plane, you can pop right. open that iPad or start watching a movie and continue to watch it through the announcement. And as long as you hang on to it or stow it at least in the pocket in front of you um, during takeoff and landing, you're all right. Yeah. They're not going to give you a hard yeah. time. Then they're, they're happy yeah. with it. So but you do have to turn nice. cellular off. That still is going to be one of the main regulations. You can't make phone calls. From, you know, once you, right. once you try right. and get airborne. Which, which makes, you know, that's okay. I mean, I, I get yeah. that. I get that. I mean, eh, whatever. I mean, everything will be VoIP eventually anyways. We're going to be doing, making our phone calls through VoIP. Right. Through the Wi-Fi that they're providing on these flights anyways. So, you know, it doesn't matter. Right. But anyways, I tell you what, guys, before we go any further, let's go ahead and take a quick break to hear from a couple of our sponsors. Are you frustrated with slightly out of focus images when you know your autofocus spot was dead on? It's simply not your fault. From manufacturer to manufacturer, and even lens copy to lens copy, there are slight variances to the exact spot where light is being focused onto the sensor. Finally, there's a product that allows you to compensate for those variances and make sharper images immediately. 
Focus Pyramid, the autofocus lens calibration tool, is an absolute must for every photographer. If you want to make the sharpest images possible, then you need to take control over your camera's focusing system. With the Focus Pyramid, you can calibrate all of your lenses on your lunch break. The Focus Pyramid makes lens calibration quick and easy at an affordable price. So give your lenses a new lease on life and take your photography to the next level. Head over to focuspyramid.com forward slash DPC and get an additional 10% off just for being a show listener. As photographers, we're always trying to increase sales and profits after every event. We shoot an event and have hundreds or even thousands of images that just sit on our hard drives. Perhaps a better workflow would increase sales by getting those valuable images in front of the client. That's where ShootProof comes in. At ShootProof.com, you can have an online gallery for all of your clients' proofing needs. ShootProof helps increase profits while building your brand and securing your photos without charging commission fees on sales. ShootProof galleries display your photos beautifully while helping to streamline your workflow and automate more of your business through their intuitive studio control panel. Once approved, photos can be directly fulfilled through ShootProof's various professional lab partners or fulfilled by you. All ShootProof plans have the same feature set. You simply choose the number of client photos stored, decide what products to sell, and the price. Try ShootProof today by taking advantage of their free 30-day trial offer. As a Digital Photography Cafe viewer, ShootProof is offering a 20% discount off any of their premium plans by using promo code DPC20 at checkout. ShootProof. Upload. Share. Sell. Print. All right, Joe, the Nikon DF, huh? This new camera just uh, released. It was kind of uh, leaked and kind of little sneaky videos and stuff for like a week or so. But uh, sneaky peek. They finally, yeah. they finally uh, made the big announcement and showed all the pictures of it. And uh, this kind of looks neat. You know, it combines the, you know, kind of a classic looking design of a of a, an old rangefinder camera with uh, right. with uh, all the new goodness of today's technology, right? I really, really, really like this. Um, uh, you know, if anyone's listened for some time that we've been doing this for a couple of years, you know, my first camera was a Minolta SRT 102, all, all manual, absolutely beautiful, rugged metal, beautiful, um, film, film camera. I still use it for some creative work that I do for large print, black and whites. Um, I love that camera. When I look at this Nikon, it just takes me right. Sure. Back. If you take a look at this Nikon, um, the DF and you look at the top of it, it is just amazing the control that you have on these dials. I mean, yeah, it's got all the dials and stuff like an old fam film camera would. Absolutely. You have ISO, you have adjustment for, um, exposure compensation, right? It's nice. Your, your, your shutter speeds, your, everything is like all on these manual dials at the top, right? So you, you really don't have to go into the menus. You just sit there and just select them based on these little um, toggles and whatnot. Um, it's just beautiful. And it's all magnesium. Absolutely love that. When you look at it, it looks like a metal camera of old days, the old um, SLRs. It's absolutely beautiful. What I really like about it also is that it is a full frame camera. Yep. Don't really care for that. It's 16 megapixels, but I tell you what. If it's if it's using every one of those megapixels well at 16, sure. um, I'm fine with that. I am actually okay with that. It's doing CMOS. It's got the XP3. It's running from 100 um, all, all, the, all the way up to 12,800 ISO. Yep. So it's not you. It's not way out there. That means I'm going to guess it'll probably be good right around 800 to 1600. Probably it would still get good pictures with it. Like it has the 39 um, autofocus points. That's very important to yep. me. You know, of course, you have your F lens mount, which is important. Kind of the the things that I look at also is what's the maximum shutter speed, and that is at four thousandth. I like to see eight thousand on it instead of four um, for daylight, you know, work. I do like that the sync speed on the flash is at uh, uh, one two hundred and fiftieth, and not you know at the two hundredth or lower, like some of these mirrorless right. want to kind of put in there a one you know one sixtieth or something, which doesn't fly with me very well. Right, right. Um, but all in all, the camera specs out really nicely. It's like, you know, a smaller body, mid-sized body, you know, DSLR. 
and it looks amazing. And I tell you what, the black version, I, I mean, I it want it. It just this. looks cool. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, I mean, the I issue yeah. with it that I see is that, you know, it it is still a mirrored camera. So it is a true yep. DSLR. It's not a, you know, taking the root of these kind of retro style mirrorless that we've been seeing cropping up all over the place. Right. Um, right. So, so, you know, whatever mirror or no mirror, you know, it's your preference. Um, the, I agree, the sensor um, size being full frame is awesome. Being 16 megapixel though, in today's technology, I'm actually kind of surprised about. Yeah. Um, especially considering that they go all the way up to what thirty six megapixel in their sure, in their sure. uh, flagship there. Um, not saying that it has to be a thirty six megapixel, but you know it is full frame. You know, yeah, I would like I would to see, see at least twenty one be being the the, yeah. the place to hit there. Um, but that said, if they've done a phenomenal job with the sensor and the processing and stuff and are really maximizing that 16 megapixel in 16 megapixel is plenty big enough for most enlargements and most oh absolutely most anything that you're going to want to do yeah it goes back to quality uh not not quantity, quantity yeah of pixels at this point so yeah um, i think the you know, biggest we'll thing that we'll turns see. me off is the price at like almost three grand <laughs> right yeah it is it is high yeah. and it's high because it's retro that's right um that's right you know, you're you're paying you're paying for, for the coolness. Yes, 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 yes. So, I do like it. I do yep. like it. I mean, I think the next camera that I that I pick up will be a mirrorless camera. Um, but I do like where they're going with this. I I just love having all of the possible settings on dials on the top of the camera. It just makes it so much easier than going into any kind of menus to change stuff. You just, you know, you flip a switch and you're done. You just keep going, right, rocking, right. This, you know, the photos. So, I mean, but all in all, we'll see. We're going to report back to see what kind of, um, you know, how it reviews out. Um, take a look at some pictures, how, what, you know, what they look like. Did they take advantage of those 16 megapixels um, or did they not? How does it do in low light? These are the type of issues that really are important to me. So, yes. Yes. So uh, Instagram, you know, we're all photographers. We all love imagery. And Instagram has been growing, you know, by leaps and bounds for, for a long time now. Now that Facebook took it over, you know, I, I mean, that that's helped with the popularity of it and everything. Sure. And uh, but, you know, we had mentioned a few shows back that we had heard the rumors that they're going to start rolling out ads. Yeah, as photographers, we love photos mm. as much as we love ads. Oh, ads right? are awesome. I live for ads. That's yeah. right. So, but obviously with no surprise, there's, they started rolling out ads to a big backlash. There's a lot of ticked off people and stuff. And and that's the thing. When you build a community around sharing imagery or text messages or, or whatever, like Twitter or what have you, you know, and you build it kind of this open, free type of an environment. And then you decide, hey, it's time to monetize it. We actually need to make yeah. some money. And then you start throwing ads in it. You're going to get pushback. You know, you're going to get Absolutely. people that are ticked off. And, you know, I mean, honestly, what somebody should do, the next big social network, just start out with the ads already in place. Even yeah, if they're just promotions Say, listen, for your it's own free. Stuff, you know, <laughs> absolutely. It's just like they do um, with apps. Um, on your phone, yeah. you know, yeah. we'll give it to you for free or you're going to pay a dollar ninety nine. Yeah. But if you don't want the ads, you're going to pay 10 bucks. And you know what? I, people might be happy paying for, for example, Facebook um, at, let's say, five dollars a month and have no nonsense. I have none of the, and the thing damn just works and not don't keep pushing me stuff that I don't want onto my phone and using my data. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? I'll pay the five bucks, you know, uh, that. So, well, I don't know. Yeah, I tell they you what, Michael Kors. Front for a service. Um, I mean, that that would be hard to, to get into. Um, a lot of people would be resistant from that, especially for building a community. But, you know, at least right. I mean, at least if you threw out ads in there right from day one. You know, even even just again, like I said, promoting your own stuff, at least you're kind of gauging expectations. And then all of a sudden you're not pulling the rug out from people and, and uh, you know, yeah. then so, throwing them this stuff. I mean, imagine if Facebook goes and charges ninety nine cents okay? yep. and they get a dollar for every person that uses Facebook. One point one nine billion monthly. Okay, active so users. they get one point one nine billion. So two billion every month. Yeah. I think they'd be okay with that. And I think that they're the, the number of people that would still do it for the, for the 99 cents, um, for the cost of, you know, um, a third of a, of a latte or something. Yep. I think that they would do it. 
and they would ha not have to do it. I tell you what, Michael Kors is probably not a happy guy right now because they, he was like the, you know, his ad was the guinea pig over there, um, you know, on Instagram. And the pushback on Michael Kors was pretty heavy. And it wasn't even, you know, and he was the the ad spot that was kind of introduced. And they were thinking, you know, Ben and Jerry's and Levi's will be next and all the rest of them. And they're probably rethinking this now. Like, oh, my God, maybe we shouldn't get on board with this just yet, you know, and really <laughs> yeah. analyze what is there any detriment to us doing this? How much pushback are we going to get right. from being the first couple of, you know, ads that roll through the millions of Instagram users? Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, well, the yeah, study shows know. that Instagram is the fastest growing social network among marketers. So, I mean, you yeah, know, photo is worth a thousand words, Fred, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a great platform for people to, uh, you know, for them to run ads on. I mean, people are, are, you know, going there to look at stuff. So why not look at sure. an ad? So, yeah, we'll see how this yeah. plays out. This will be interesting. I know, you know, we talked about Pressgram um, a while back, which is kind of a, right. an Instagram-esque type of new social network that is being developed with a WordPress plugin that allows you to add those photos into your own site as well, kind of as right. they're created. And right. um, it really is gaining in popularity. I've been watching it closely because it kind of uh, really interests me. It's really been sure. gaining in popularity and who knows? I mean, there could be another company that comes in and, and uh, you know, really starts to take over on uh, what some of these big boys are doing now. Yeah, it's just, you know, how you do it and how you start yep. to do it is what's important. You know, you give away, you know, the farm, the cow, the milk, everything for free from the get go. And then all of a sudden everyone just expects that. Right. Um, you know, if right. you charge from the beginning, you might not be able to grow the community. Um, but there's got to be something. In there's got to be. A happy and that's medium. what. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what they need to find. Yeah. I tell you what, you know. We've talked about Facebook in the past and, you know, we've I've done some um, analysis based on uh, running ads on Facebook. And, you know, my, you know, let's say all the things that I've tried to to use Facebook for as far as the advertisement just failed horribly. Yeah, it just wasn't yeah. a very good platform for me to advertise. And I know you've done some testing and there's some data back about advertising on Facebook. Yeah, right? yeah. The, um, Forrester actually um, just recently did released a report. Um, it's one of those big paid for reports, but they give you enough information to kind of wet your whistle. So that's kind of where we pulled it from. But, uh, you know, as we had mentioned, there's 1.19 billion active monthly users. So you would think that that would yeah, be a couple. fantastic platform to run your ads in. You're going to get exposure to just so many people. And, uh, you know, womp, but it's, it's really not working out that way. <laughs> Um, yes, no. I agree. I have run some Facebook ad tests um, in the past myself with very mediocre results. Um, yeah, at best. And these are the ads that appear like on the right hand side of the of your page. I mean, they're not the inline news stream ads. Um, those right. are different. So Forrester, in this uh, sir, you know, in this report, they indicate that they they surveyed 395 marketers and business executives. And found that Facebook ranks at the bottom, the very last out of 13 um, networks or channels that they would use to um, promote their businesses. And yeah, to convey their message yep. to. Absolutely. You know, it's it's banner ad blindness. It's the, you know, right side bar blindness. Yep. However you want to call it. When, when people are pushing these ads to us and we know where they're located, um, we don't even... We don't look, even at, look it. at it. If there's a yeah. pop up, we immediately close yeah. it. We turn pop ups off in our browsers. Anything that we can do to stop the advertisement from hitting us, we do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised by this at all. I mean, I I came up with the same results. It doesn't work. No, me. I mean, it, basically, it, the report is saying that Facebook advertising um, is pretty much dead. But where the value on Facebook is is your Facebook page. That's where the right. engagement happens. So all the big boys like Coca-Cola, you know, Red Bull, all those types of, of companies, they've realized that the value in their Facebook presence is their page in continuing to engage with their community, to build, you know, relationships with their community, getting their community involved with the different, you know, applications that they run off Facebook and such. Um, that's where the really real value is, not necessarily as a customer acquisition but right. as a brand no. recognition and customer yeah. engagement. 
type of system. Yes. Now, yes, it's it's easy, right, to to market to or sell an ad to or push to or communicate to folks that are already that have liked your page right. that are involved in your specific business. Right. That is a a you know, that's where, you know, Facebook shines. Yes. It really does well because every time you put something out and someone likes it or or um, somehow acknowledges it, it ends up on their page, too. Yes. So what happens is those numbers exponentiate. You right. have 10 friends. One, you know, all 10 like something. Well, every one of their friends are going to see this also in the feed. So that that's where, you know, it works out. But, you know, just like you said, it's OK to market to your, you know, the people that are already, you know, like you, so to speak. But to try to gain traction by getting new people on board. Failure. It's a lot harder. Yeah. I mean, I have done tests with promoted posts in the past and I've had really good results from them, but I had a certain expectation. I was not looking to get right. new likes to the fan pages. I was looking to increase engagement. Um, I'm sure right. as you guys know, Facebook has changed their algorithms over the year um, where your like, posts like Google. just drop. I mean, unless you're out there, unless you're popular, unless people are commenting and liking and sharing your posts all the time, your posts will drop basically in authority and just not show up in the news feeds. Yeah. And I know that's that's something that we all face, right? I mean, it's it's hard to do social media the way it needs to be done. And when you're out there working for a living, shooting and editing photos and stuff, you don't always have the time to sit in front of the computer and, and you know, put in status updates to Facebook. Yeah, and, and let's say do it right. To do it right. So that's that's what happens when you log into your Facebook page, you look under your title there and it shows your number of people talking about, you know, and then you'll start seeing it drop down to like five people, you know, three people yeah. and stuff. So I guess, I, absolutely. So I guess to get out of all of this, you know, what does it boil down to? Facebook advertisement, the ROI, the return on investment is not there Put your money elsewhere. Yeah, <laughs> that's just it. Yeah, and Unless try you're communicating with your because current, that's a great try, way to yeah. kickstart your Facebook page again with your community, but with your current with your current base. community. But to you do, re, you know, as we right. always say, you have to um, the fans on your Facebook page, your business page, need to be people who are potential customers. If you're a photographer right. and all of the people that like your page are other photographers. <laughs> Unless you're selling something to photographers, it's not going to benefit you. You're not going to get anything out of it. It's a waste of time. Um, if you are a photographer and you're trying to sell to end clients, you need to get your customers on there. You need to get the, right. the friends and family of your customers on there and liking your page. And that yeah. comes you do a, you know You do a wedding, you know, send that bride and groom a couple of pics from the wedding. Yep. They will share it. And every single one of their friends and family will most likely share it too, because it's such a special day. And the amount of notoriety, publicity, awareness of you um, that you receive yep. is it's huge. It, the possibilities are huge. But to try to put an ad out there to try to get people to your page, yeah, um, using fa using Facebook's ad just doesn't um, work model, well. it it fails every yep. time. So anyways, we need to get out of here. Yep. Good stuff as usual, I think, my friend. So uh, we are done for the day. And if uh, people want to connect with you outside of the show, what's the best way for them to reach you? You can find me on Twitter, and that's at Joseph Christina, and that's Christina without an H. Great. And you can connect with me on Twitter. It's at Trevor Current. So all right, guys, we are out of here for yet another week. Wow. Episode 129. So anyways, you can get all the show notes from this episode by visiting digitalphotographycafe.com forward slash 129. And don't forget to send your questions and comments to comments at digitalphotographycafe.com or simply call 440-345-6707. Once again, that's 440-345-6707. And we will see you next week. You've been watching the Digital Photography Cafe show with Trevor Curran and Joseph Christina. Be sure to subscribe to the show for free in iTunes or through RSS. You can also listen on Stitcher and TuneIn Radio and watch in HD on TiVo. Visit digitalphotographycafe.com for show notes and to connect with your hosts.